So welcome to this uh, workshop. It's a really two-part workshop, which means uh, you'll get some homework. And if there's anybody who's coming in next week who wasn't here today, uh, they'll have to find out what the homework was and, and, and catch up with it. But if they're not here today, it's going to be a little tricky. In any case, um, really, this is all about teaching and learning. How many people have been taking a teaching workshop before? Good. <laughs> it means I can say whatever I want. You'll believe me, maybe. Um, oops, oops, I turned that on. Does it work? Ah, it does work, okay. Uh, I'm Gary Haleda. I'm from the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and I do a lot of stuff with education. So uh, hopefully what I have to say will be of benefit to you. You'll learn a little bit about the teaching process. Are you all uh, postdoctoral researchers or postdoctoral? No? Well, what are you? PhD student. PhD student. How many people are PhD students? How many people are postdocs? And you're MFA. MFA. Yeah. Okay, that's good. MFA student. Okay, I just wanted to see who was here. It always helps to know who you're talking to. One of the rules of teaching is to know who your audience is. It's not really an audience, but you get the idea. To find out what, and the other important thing is to find out what you want to know about. Now, I assume you're here because you want to know about something about teaching and education and learning and learning styles uh, because you read the description. So, hopefully, you understand that, and hopefully, I understand that about you. Um, let's just, well, we'll plunge right into it. I don't have any really other introductory material, but really, I want to talk about what's important and what we're going to talk about. So, um, we have certain learning objectives that we want to try to attain. Now, uh, the learning objective for this group is obvious. You want to learn about teaching and learning. But if you t create a class or create a lecture or teach a class, you really want to share with your students something about the teaching and learning process itself. You want to certainly start by sharing with them the idea of what the actual learning objectives are for the course. Uh, so you should want to teach well. That's one of the reasons why this is important, one of our objectives or to talk about why teaching well is important. You want your students to learn. If you don't want your students to learn, then obviously why are you here or why are you teaching in the first place? Uh, and you want to try to enjoy the process somewhat. You don't want this to be such a burden. I know coming from the world of, of researchers in sciences and engineering that there can be a, an idea that there's some sort of burden to the teaching process, that it shouldn't be something you're excited about or want to really invest a lot of time in. What areas are you from? I know you're an MFA. What, what other uh, areas of majors or research are you involved in? Uh, life science. Life sciences, okay. Particle physics. Particle physics, okay. Psychology. Psychology. English. English. Physiology. Physiology. Ecology and evolution. Ecology and evolution. Well, no two people from the same place. This is good. We have a nice diversity here. So you know coming from physics or coming from some of these other areas that the view of teaching is not always consistent amongst faculty. Uh, some see it more as they, they, they want to be researchers, teaching is not that important, but it really is the most important thing. Uh, because you, you know, it, it's important to you because you want to enjoy it, you want to do it well, you want to learn about the process and do it better, but also you want to make sure that, um, that the research you do is even supported by your teaching. And that's important. Um, and something else I've talked about in the past is, is development of, of teaching philosophies and teaching statements. That's something that I have talked about in other workshops, how to create a teaching philosophy or teaching statement. That part's very important if you want to apply for jobs somewhere, which is one of the reasons why I like to talk to postdocs and grad students about it. Um, obviously, when you're applying for a position somewhere that includes teaching, you want to be able to include uh, a good teaching statement as part of your application. So I won't talk about that today. I want to talk just today about this idea of teaching and learning and what's important about that. So for today, um, we want to look at the relationship between teaching and learning. We want to look at what learning is, how we learn, how others learn, um, and how do we teach effectively. So those are our goals that we want to try to, try to pursue, understanding some of these things. So I'm going to talk about teaching styles. Um, I'll, let me, I'll get to that in a second, uh, but there's a lot of different philosophies out there. I'm talking about one, one set of philosophies, and not everybody agrees with it either. So you have to, it's interesting for you to get out there and read about different types of teaching methods or teaching philosophies. 
Okay. Um, and the first thing I just want to ask you, another little response question. I just want to get your reflections on this because this is very helpful in developing these models. Now, we've all had teachers. We've all learned things. You've gone to college. You've gone to high school. You've gone to grade school. Or you've taken courses somewhere. You've learned something from someone, a, a music teacher, somebody who taught you how to ride a horse. I don't know how to, you know, milk a rabbit. I don't know what. But the idea is you, you've learned things. In, probably not that one. But you've learned things in the past. And you know, at some point, you've had good teachers and you've had bad teachers. Sometimes we think, we think about both. And um, I just want you to think about that for, for just a second. They, you know, the, it's something that you just talked about how a bad presentation versus a good presentation material. Being funny is important. Being, being personable is important. And you don't have to be a, you know, a, a, a thespian to be a good teacher. I mean, a good teacher is just somebody who recognizes um, sort of what resonates with the people they're talking to. Right, and that's what you mentioned. There's a, there's a technique behind making things meaningful to students using real world examples that they may be familiar with. Some people have done that very poorly. I remember a teacher who taught in um, a very uh, uh, poor area in a city uh, who I talked to, um, somebody from his school once. And he said the teachers were using examples from books that were about things the students would never have ever encountered in their lives. You know, how much dock space is needed for your yacht, you know? And it wasn't even that, but it was just things that they, that had nothing to do with these students. With, and, and so therefore it turned them off. You know, they weren't, they weren't interested at that point. So this idea of resonating with the students is very important. I remember that was a, um, you know, a, 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 a quote from, a, from a, a friend of mine who was in the music business, who his, one of his favorite uh, musicians, um, that he ever knew in his life was Jimi Hendrix. And he said that the reason, great guitarist, great composer, the reason he liked, he said he was so good because he could play a note and he would bend and change that note until it reached a resonance with each person in the audience. And it was an idea that the music would, would resonate with people. So what I've heard so far is that you all know what good teaching is already, so you can all get out of here now. So it's, uh, <laughs> but you, you have examples. These are things you have to hang on to. Because you're gonna, these are going to influence you when you teach. Those of you who are teaching already in various ways or have taught, you've probably had a little bit of that in what you're doing. So that's important. So, that's, so, so there's certain things that have that is certain common themes about a good teacher. Um, I, always, I forgot I had the slide in here. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen there. there there's, I always point out some movies I've seen about teachers. I don't know if anybody's seen any of these movies. Um, I think people used to Dead Poets Society at Robin Williams, Emperor's Club with Kevin Klein. Um, I, several things that I always I always point out about this. What what's what's the problem with uh, with the teacher with, with this imagery from these two? And you can name at least two things right off the bat. Oh, guys. Yeah, that's one. Second one. I always point out. There's also teachers. There's also movies about about uh, um, you know very good uh, women teachers. But I just had these two pictures in here. So yeah. Well, they, I mean, they're both set in really exclusive environments, right? With students that sort of have a lot of resources. And well, these are these are private schools. That's something else that's wrong. I mean, what's the focal point? Teacher. Teacher. I mean, these are movies about teachers. So the focal point would be the teacher. In the real world, that's wrong. <laughs> the focal point is the students. First of all, they outnumber you. <laughs> Most of the time in the classroom, students outnumber the teacher, <laughs> unless you're teaching no one. They'll at least be equal to or greater than the number of teacher in the room. <laughs> so, so the, you know, by, by that definition alone, you have to focus on the students and what's going on with them. Um, you know, in both these cases, they show what wonderful, wonderful people these teachers are, these white male teachers, and <laughs> you know, from these exclusive clubs. But that's not the point. The point that I want to point, the, the thing I want to point out is that in both these cases, we see the teacher as the focal point. Um, although if you watch the movie, obviously they go into the students. The movie is also about the students. The, the box covers are about these people because they, that goes back to VCR's box covers. The box covers are about these people because they are the stars of the movie. Um, but anyway, so you've seen what's wrong with those pictures. So when we think about what a good teacher is, there's lots of images of teachers, but of course they all focus on the teacher as the sage on the stage, you know, the one in front of the room who's doing the singing and dancing and who's, who, you're not you know, there for entertainment value, but that's not really what teachers are. 
When I think of images of good teachers, this is an old picture, but that to me is an image of a good teacher, and the thing about the images is there's no teacher in the picture. You know, these are students working on a project together in a classroom, uh, and the teacher is A, taking the picture, <laughs> and, but B, you know, the, the students are learning from each other. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're learning different things about a project. The teacher is there to help uh, motivate them, to help conduct the project, to give them information they need, to respond to questions. But overall, the focus has to be on the students. So that's why this is a picture that represents of a student-focused classroom. And that's the way I like to think about teaching. All right, um, here's a few quotes about teaching that I think are relevant. Uh, it's from Galileo. You've heard of him before. Physics, astronomy. Uh, we cannot teach people anything. We can only help them discover it within themselves. That quote's been said many times, many ways, by many different people over time. And it's extremely important. The idea that, that you have to... Learning is a self-process. You learn. No one learns it to you. <laughs> you, know? You, you, know, you have to learn the material. A teacher is there as maybe a, sort of a composer or a director, but the musicians are playing the instruments. Yeah. Um, and here's a, quote, here's a nice joke. Teacher, I taught my dog to whistle. Student, I don't hear him whistle. Teacher, I say I taught him and say he learned it. So, yeah, it, it's stupid, I know. Um, <laughs> here's another quote. I forget what I was taught. I only remember what I have learned. Okay, another quote saying essentially the same thing as Galileo in another way. And uh, one more funny quote for you. A professor is one who talks in someone else's sleep. So hopefully that's not what you are as a, a teacher in a classroom. You don't talk in your students' sleep because it disturbs their sleep. And they probably need it if they're sleeping in your classroom. Um, and it's also, unless, unless your, your words are penetrating to their subconscious and they're learning anyway, it's probably not going to work very well. Yeah, it'd be neat. Be a neat trick, you know, yeah. Just put the class to sleep and walk around talking gently to them. That reminds me of some yoga classes I had a long time ago where basically everybody just went, you know. <laughs> It was nice. I got a nap. All right. So in general, in general, a good teacher is one who uses teaching methods that are student focused. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about next. Understand to some extent that we learn differently. This may not, this has an impact on teaching. The fact that people learn in different ways. It may not be the whole story though. And I'll show you, I'll give you a contradictory example to that. Two of them actually. Uh, and they tailor their teaching styles somewhat to the students' learning styles, but they may also introduce something which I've recently been learning about because I was hit over the head by, I went to a teaching uh, conference, uh, well, a conference where there was a symposium on teaching in Pittsburgh about um, a couple weeks ago, and there was somebody there, I started talking about learning styles, and I thought they were going to throw a desk at me. I, <laughs> this person got up and said, they've been proved to be false, you know, and so, okay. Uh, <laughs> Calm down, calm down. And we had a discussion. I found out he didn't really mean that. But he was referring to someone who found out that learning styles aren't the whole story. And this actually gets to your point over there about teachers who make you do things that are hard. This is something called desirable difficulties. And that's been a new topic that's been coming up in some psychology studies over the last three or four years. Uh, some, some different ground on teaching. So I'll show you two different models developed essentially over the last 25 years. First, but there is a lot to say about learning styles because learning styles are different. All right? No one actually doubts that. Some people doubt how the connection between teaching and learning styles works. That's fine. But learning styles are real and I want to talk about those and also ask you to do a little online thing. Obviously not here today, but when we get back together again, hopefully you'll be here next week and you can tell me what happened. If not, you can email me your results. Um, so teaching and learning methods, I'm going to talk about a uh, paper which I've referred to before by uh, Felder and Solomon. Uh, Felder, they're both at North Carolina State University. Felder is the, is the you know, one of the leaders in uh, the engineering education research area. Um, he's done a lot in that area. And uh, that's, I'll, I'll, I guess we can provide the websites to people who are interested. You know, we'll, be able, we'll be able to do that uh, as time goes on. So, oh, let me hurry up here. 
<laughs> I, I get di divergent and I want to be able to talk about all this. So I'm gonna, I may step through these a little quickly. If I do, I'll give the slides in and plus you just read the paper. You'll learn more than you ever want to know about this stuff. It's an approach developed through a number of studies over the past 25 years. It's written for science and engineering students, this paper and the, the research behind it, but it's applicable to all areas. All right. There's also another person working on this right now. His name is, last name is Price. I think he's at Bucknell. He's working with Felder currently. Bucknell has some interesting people working on engineering education. Uh, so in terms of learning styles, I'll mention a few and you'll go learn more about this after this class. Anybody ever hear about learning styles before? You have? Okay. You've read some, so you didn't take a workshop but you've read something about learning styles. Anybody ever read anybody who, who hates learning styles? Okay. I'll mention that one too. <laughs> um, so I'll only mention a few of these. I'll, I, I'll just give you a list and then I'll go over some of them. Uh, the ones that Felder and Solomon discuss are active versus reflective. That's somewhat obvious, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. It, you may have heard of active learning, active teaching. That's a very important thing to incorporate in your process. For example, the teacher who made students draw a map of Spain. That's active learning. Right? Actually getting people engaged in doing something. Reflective is also important though. Students need time to think. Sometimes you can go too fast, too many activities, too much going on. So people learn in different ways. Some prefer active, some prefer reflective. Sensing versus intuitive. Sensing is an interaction with the world. It's, it's, it's basically more uh, externally focused. You might think of extroverts versus introverts in this way. But it's really having more, more about what you take in from the outside as part of what helps you learn. Intuitive involves more of your internal thinking process. It's similar to reflective, but a little bit different where you put ideas together. Visual versus verbal, obvious. I won't say much about that. Um, and sequential versus global. Some people, especially engineering students in many cases, often say they like to th see, learn things one step at a time. Uh, global learners are the people who want to see the whole picture and then back out of that and try to learn individual things from it. I tend to be more of a globalist in, my, in what I like. Um, and there's also something called inductive versus deductive, which they talk about in some of their papers, not others. I really won't say much about that. Um, uh, I'll try to move forward a little quickly on that one. Um, basically, we all, we're all inductive learners. It's how, you know, if, you know, when you see a person with a dog, you know that that's a dog, not a rat, although sometimes you can't tell. Um, but you might, you know, because you've learned inductively that, that dogs look a certain way because you've seen many examples. So you build up your theory based on many different examples you've seen. Deductive learning involves more that, more that you want to know the whole theory first, the whole picture, and then take examples out of that to see how the theory works. That's like a lab class where somebody says, okay, today we're going to learn about, you know, uh, you know, the theory of electromagnetism. And we're going to do this experiment to prove how it works to you. That's more deductive learning. Some people, yeah, and people like each way, but basically all people are inductive learners essentially from the start and become deductive learners in school. But that's not so much a preference as these others are up here according to Felder and Solomon. I'm going to run through this a little fast. If there's some questions, please ask me. I don't want to step on something you want to know. Active reflective, active learners uh, retain, understand information best by doing something with it. They don't want to just hear the information and let it sit there. Um, they could discuss it, they could apply it, they could explain it to others. There's a tremendous value, by the way, in uh, people talking to each other about ideas. Having, uh, it's called you know, peer teaching, having students teach students, something you might think about. Um, because when a student teaches something to another student, they learn it much, much better. All right? There's a lot, of, a lot of studies have shown that. Reflective learners want to think about it quietly first. Uh, let's try it out, see how it works, that's an active learner, let's think it through first as reflective. Uh, active learners tend to like group work more than reflective learners who prefer working alone. I often ask my students this, do you prefer, you know, how many of you study alone, how many of you study in groups? Um, it, there's, there's always a split in the class. I try to find out what my students like to do because it tells me about how they like to learn. Um, sitting through lectures without getting to do anything obviously is hard for active learners. So that's something you should know. So no questions about this. So um, this is just one of the, uh, there's many, many papers out there on pedagogical works, on typologies, different types of learners. 
Uh, this is one in which uh, it was a Honey and Mumford study where they split up learners between uh, those who, who prefer concrete experience versus abstract experience and then reflective versus active. So you can, you can take reflective versus active and combine it with other things. So some, some people are active learners, but they prefer abstract concepts. Some are active learners, usually prefer concrete concepts. And they're trying to show that with the arrows here. That people, you know, reflective learners prefer abstractions. But that's just, again, it says something about how our brain works, but our brains are always a combination of these things. You know, I have students often, uh, when I talk about the impact of technology in society, I have students read both dystopian and utopian stories about, say, nanotechnology as a way to understand how we think about what technology could do. And I, well, one thing we find out is if you ask them, is this story 100% you know, utopian or dystopian, they always say it's somewhere in the middle. Because every, I, I found very few stories that are entirely one thing or the other. So it's usually a mix of these. Um, so active learning can, it doesn't mean you have to do labs, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, go through all the effort to, you know, come in and bring in tinker toys for the students and let them, you know, build a, a map or something. <laughs> you could if you want to, but it's, it's as simple as just asking students to solve problems in class or, or answer questions, asking, asking questions like I do. Formulate their own questions, explain, debate. Any of these things can be distributed any way you want in a lecture if you want to try to make a more active class. That's good, especially if you have a class where half the people are falling asleep um, because this immediately gets them engaged. There's also technologies that can help you do this. You know, for example, the student response technologies like the clickers that we use sometimes. Those are a very good way to get an active component into a lecture with 100 or 200 students. Because that's hard to do. Large classes are hard to build in active learning. Although you can, you can do anything, take them for a walk. You can do something to break up the class to do something. Um, and it's very student focused, obviously. All these ways are. Um, and a method for this, for example, is cooperative learning. I won't get into that in detail. Cooperative learning are getting students to work together in groups to do things. And um, it requires, um, it require, according to Felder anyway, cooperative learning isn't just putting students in groups and saying, now go solve this. It's ensuring that there's some inter positive interdependence and individual accountability in it. That's very hard to do. Anybody who's ever put students in groups to do a project knows that there's always, there are always students that fall out. That, that don't participate in the group as much. They kind of sit there, hmm, you know. And trying to get them involved in what you can do is a very hard thing to do. I, there's no easy solution for that. Uh, sometimes you can do it by saying that each member of the group will assess every other member of the group. So they suddenly realize that how much they interact with each other is part of their grade. I mean, you can push it that way as well. But this, in, any, in any case, there are things you can do for this. I'd like you to think about that between now and next week. In fact, for next week, I want you to think about some teaching things that you can do that respond to some of these theories that we're talking about. And then when we get back together again, hopefully we can talk about ideas you've had for specific courses and things you want to do. Um, and, and so basically there's essential co components. One of the ones he mentions, by the way, is face-to-face -face interaction. A lot of people ask whether um, distance learning technologies can be used to build groups. There are studies on that right now. For example, doing senior design groups in engineering by having some members of the group be in another country. Um, that can be very good for service learning as well. Um, the idea that you can serve a community, not even locally, but maybe even internationally, by what your project is in class. Um, so that's questionable whether it has to be face-to-face -face or not. It should be. Um, individual accountability, I mentioned, is important. Interpersonal and small group skills are important. And there has to be a way for the group to reflect on what it does. Reflection is very important. Um, I want to get back to that next week. Next week I want to talk about reflection in the context of assessment. Okay, let me go down to the other techniques because I want to go through these and mention a couple things. Sensing versus intuitive. All right, that's a picture I found online. I had the website on there. It fell off. I don't know who drew this, but I like it. It's simple. Uh, so a sensor is somebody who senses. So they, they look at the, the, what's going on in the world around them. That becomes the primary form of their learning. 
They want to try to do things. It's part of active learning. They want to try to see things, interact with them. Uh, whereas an intuitive learner takes in data or information. They may not even do the experiments themselves. They may collect data, and then they're going to think about the data and come up with, and they're going to learn. They're going to develop their intuition of what the data means by bringing it in and thinking about it for a while. Obviously, you want students to do both. So again, no one is completely a sensor or an intuiter, but sensors, some, some prefer it. Or if you think about what Robert Bjork says, I'm going to mention in a minute, he, he, you know, these are different skill sets that people obtain throughout life. And so people are skilled in different ones. It reflects their personality as well as their experiences. And that gets them to the point where they feel like more of this than the other. We'll learn which ones you are as well with a little work you'll do after this class. So sensing learners like to learn facts. Intuitive learners prefer discovering relationships between things. Uh, sensors like solving problems usually by well-established methods. They don't like surprises. They want to see it. You know, show me. It's like that, the, the Missouri or whatever is a show me state. They want to just show me. That's how I want to understand it. Uh, intuitors like innovation. They just like repetition. Uh, sensors are more likely than intuitors to resent being tested on material that has not been explicitly covered in class. You always get the famous question from students, is this on the test? I have, I have had students who are adamant about that. I say, here's four things to study for the quiz. If I don't ask all four, they get really, really upset. I'll say, okay, I'm going to ask two of the four now. It's the day I'm giving the quiz. You told me four. You know, it gets very angry. I don't understand that. That's, it's hard. <laughs> Say, look, it's still, you're still studying the four. I want you to know two. Just, uh, I, I studied all four. Okay, come up with two more questions and put them on the back. <laughs> Write your own quiz. So there. So sensors tend to be patient with details, good at memorizing facts and doing lab work. Intuitors are better at grasping new concepts, often more comfortable with abstractions. Uh, sensors tend to be more practical or careful. Intuitors like to work faster, often more innovative, because they've done so much internal work that they can jump to conclusions very quickly about things. Uh, but you need both types. Sensors don't like courses that have no connection to the real world. Intuitors don't like those plug and chug courses. Here's the equation. Here's a whole bunch of numbers. Stick them in the equation. Tell me what answer you got. You know, they, 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 they think that's a waste of time. They want to think about it more. They want to come up with things. So some people are more skillful at being sensors. Some are more skillful at intuition. Um, Problem-based learning is a great technique. We're going to, I want to mention techniques. I don't have, oh, I'll put that. I don't have much time to talk about it, but I can, I can mention a few techniques. We have till, uh, till two. Tomorrow. No. <laughs> um, so intuitors. Uh, like problem-based learning often, because problem-based learning um, is really about discovering. All right? It's a great technique to use. You might consider this in your classes. Uh, it's an, here's a, an, uh, from an article, uh, Problem-Based Learning, What and How Do Students Learn? Uh, problem-based le learning, student learning centers on a complex problem that doesn't have a single correct answer. Students often work in groups. They collaborate to identify what they need to learn to solve the problem. They engage in self-directed learning and apply that knowledge to the problem and reflect on what they've learned. So these are all parts of the problem-based learning process. Very, very useful for intuitive learners, or learners who like intuitive, uh, who like to intuit answers. Um, I'll put the slides online. You're not gonna have time to write too much about this. Um, so you, the skills developed for problem-based lear uh, problem learning uh, are skills in analyzing problems, finding out what's really important that's always the, probably it's the most important question, is what is actually important to solve a problem? That's part of problem-based learning. Brainstorming, which is a group activity, you can't brainstorm by yourself. It gets really boring really fast if you sit there and say, okay, I'm gonna brainstorm now the answer to this. No, um, you need other people for that. Uh, knowledge building, uh, for how do you find the information you need? How do you make sure that information is valid? You know, I've had, I actually had students who, write, who wrote a paper for me once analyzing the uh, failure of the space shuttle Columbia, and they, one of their sources was um, conspiracytheory.com. They actually use that as their source in their paper. <laughs> so, you know, finding out the validity of resources is important, and then how do you analyze your data? 
these are skills you develop as a result of this. Um, I won't go through all the steps of problem-based learning, but basically first you present them with a problem, then oftentimes there's a, and this takes a couple days, uh, usually a couple classes. Usually there's a, some kind of group tutorial where they discuss the problem, they figure out, brainstorm ideas, identify what they need to know, they reason through it and come up with an action plan. They engage in independent study on their learning issues, uh, what they need to know. Basically, students have to sit down and figure out what don't we know, what do we need to know. Then they come back, they share the information, they teach each other, they work their way through it, uh, they present and discuss their solution to the problem, and then they review what they learned by working on the problem. Uh, all that participate in the process engage in self-peer a review of the process and each person's contribution to that process. As you see here, the teacher is not there, essentially, but the teacher is there. The teacher is making sure the steps get done. That's what the teacher does in this case. So this is student-focused. Problem-based learning is student-focused. And it's very much like the, uh, the real world. All right? it's, um, it's learning that results in the process of working toward the understanding of the resolution of a problem. Problems encountered first in the process. Nature of effective problems in problem-based learning is that they're ill-structured as opposed to well-structured. Also, they look more like real life and authentic. A problem has to look and smell authentic for it to be useful in problem-based learning. And um, they smell real, all right? So that's very important for problem-based learning. Uh, it's also very motivating. It's motivated learning because the students uh, can see why they should be interested in this. Um, they become very engaged in this process. It forces them to, to name what they need to learn to work on the problem. In, other, in some forms of learning, a lecturing, in contrast, has been referred to as the process of answering questions that students never asked in the first place. Students need to ask the questions. Problem-based learning is getting the students to ask the questions that you can teach to. So it really comes from them. And if you do it skillfully and well, you can direct it towards what you want the class to learn. You know, you have to kind of figure this out. This is where preparation it can be sometimes very complicated, right? And experience comes in handy. Um, let's see. I want to skip ahead because there's something I want to get to before we're done. I didn't realize how fast the time was going. Um, most importantly, by putting together methods like problem-based learning, cooperative learning, project-based learning, it looks more and more like the real world. And that's one of the most important things because we learn things in a real-world environment. If we look at the difference between how people learn in school you know, versus the real world, um, you know, it's a little bit different. If you have to learn how to, well, it used to be in the old days, fix your car. Nobody fixes their car anymore. You take it to someone who has a computer somewhere. But, you know, it used to be like that. You used to be learn how to fix your car. You didn't go to school for it. You, you learned because you were stuck on the side of the road. <laughs> and you had to learn. <laughs> Otherwise, you were there. So that's how it, real world learning is motivated learning. And it's learning that focuses on real world problems. And it's part of a process we find very important in engineering called lifelong learning. It means that you're a student your entire life. So the same skills they develop in school can be applied to everything they'll learn in their lives, all right? And that leads to this one statement here. Um, this gets back to something else you mentioned before. The single most important factor for student success has often been cited as the ability to teach yourself. Something about lifelong learning and learning in the real world is that here you have the teachers, here you don't. You have to teach yourself what you need to know. So it's like problem-based learning and it means you have to teach yourself. And that's the most important factor in many cases for students to be successful because they're going to have bad teachers. You've meant, some of you mentioned you had bad teachers, but you still had to learn this stuff. So you have to learn how to teach yourself. Help students learn how to teach themselves. It's incredibly important. Okay. Uh, it works well with all the learning styles I mentioned before, ver visual versus verbal is, is uh, you know, the reason you mix different types of learning together like visual learning and verbal learning. That's the way the world works. All right. Some people are more like visual information better. Some people like to receive their information verbally or by reading. In the real world, you receive it in all ways. All right. So visual, some people remember things better that they see. Some people re get more out of what either written or spoken explanations. Um, I was going to skip over this statement here. It's not that important. Um, I'll just mention this. This is a, something I saw in a teaching class once. 
the cone of learning. Sounds frightening. Uh, sounds like, behold, the cone of learning. No, uh, you have to wear it, right? <laughs> you go to class. Uh, uh, but basically, if we look at it, we compare how much we tend to remember versus our level of involvement in our own learning. All right. Vision, you know, verbal receiving, which is reading or hearing words, you tend to remember about 10% of it. It depends on what we're talking about just after a class or just after a learning session of some type. You don't remember that well if all you've done is heard someone read to you, essentially. Um, you remember 10 to 20% of what you read and what you hear. Uh, visual receiving, looking at pictures um, or watching a video, you increase the percentage that you remember. So if you read about it, hear about it, you see pictures, you see a video of it, it increases your, your learning to some degree. Still fairly low, by the way, or looking at an exhibit, say in a museum or on a field trip. Um, the more active you get, watching a demonstration, seeing it done in location where real, real people are involved in real time, that has a true impact on us. That's what field trips are for in school. That's why they do that sort of thing. Um, then you can move to more to 50% of what we hear and see, especially when it's real time and real people are involved in it. It becomes personal to us. So that's why that's important. So th but this whole area from, from seeing things, watching videos, reading about it, hearing about it, that's all part of passive education. When we think about active learning, we think about receiving and participating, like having discussions or giving a talk or a presentation. That starts to move us into the more of the realm we want to see. That's why active learning is important. Uh, and actually doing it, which could be a dramatic presentation, simulating a real experience, or doing the real thing, for example, an internship, all right, you're going to have to end up learning most of it, because otherwise you're a really crummy intern. <laughs> but if you're doing the real thing, you're involving everything about yourself, your body motion, your kinematics, your hands, your, uh, your body movements, your voice, your participation, you're generating ideas yourself, you're working with others. This just, everything you can do moves you toward greater retention. And this is something that any learning theory agrees with. But how do you do that in a classroom? And I want you to go away and think about that. <laughs> That's not easy. That's active. Um, the other last one I want to mention, and I'll mention one competing theory in our last couple minutes here, sequential versus global. Sequential learners gain understanding in linear steps, as I mentioned. Global learners like to lear learn in large jumps. They absorb the material, they see the connections, they get it. I f tend to be more global. I like to see the whole picture. Sequential learners like logical stepwise paths. Global learner learners can often not explain how they learned something. You know, you test them, how did you learn calculus? I just, I don't know. It's like one day, all of a sudden, it made sense. All of a sudden, I could see it in my head, how it was working. You know, it's certain, you know, that, that can happen in any area. You know, um, so that's sequential to global. I don't know why I have that picture there. One thing I'll give you for homework, I want to say one more thing after this. Um, I'll put this on the website. Go to this website and take the questionnaire. It'll tell you of that theory of learning styles what you are. All right? So go to www.engr.ncsu, that's North Carolina State University.edu, backslash one word, learning styles, backslash ilsweb, ilsweb.html, and fill out the questionnaire. It'll ask you for your name. You can give me any name you want. It doesn't really care. All right? And it'll tell you what your, what your preferred learning styles are. And I'd like you to try that. The, and it was Felder and Solomon wrote the questionnaire. Again, it's been around about 15 years. It's not a new thing. And they ask you questions like this. I understand something better after I A, try it out, B, think it through. Or I'd rather be considered realistic or innovative. And what happens is there's like 50 questions and you have to answer them in a hurry. You're not supposed to think about it. Just kind of run through them. Many are repetitive. When I think about what I did yesterday, I'm most likely to get a picture or words. You know? So just run through and pick A, B, A, B, whatever it is. Don't try to, don't spend more than, you know, 10 minutes on this thing. Just go through it and try it. I'm not going to go through the rest of the questions. Sorry. Um, I want to give you one thing, which I want to make sure I left five minutes for at the end here. Um, co something contradictory to this. I, like I said, I was at this meeting in Pittsburgh, and people got really, really angry when we started talking about learning styles, especially this one guy from, uh, I think it was from Ohio State. I don't know. He just, He's, he's, there, apparently, there, there was an editorial in the New York Times on learning styles, which I hadn't seen, uh, by this guy, by, by the Bjork Learning and Forgetting Lab. That's what a cool name for a lab. 
I'd love to have a lab called the Forgetting Lab. <laughs> Why weren't you here today? Oh, I forgot. Oh, success. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but he actually studies about learning and the opposite, which is really cool, about, the, about forgetting. He's a psychologist. It's this guy over here. Um, his name is Robert Bjork. He's won many awards as a psychologist. Um, he uh, probably would, you know, slap Felder. I don't know. Um, because his editorial, which was in the New York Times, I can post this information too. The, I, have, I have a copy of the editorial and, and his paper. Uh, basically, says that you put that that the whole all, the entire body of research on learning styles is faulty. It's basically because they didn't conduct their experiments correctly. Uh, basically, because in many cases they did not actually do enough controls, and that you can read the paper. And basically, he, he criticizes as a psychologist criticizes the methodology that was used. Who's a psychologist in here? Somebody psychology? Okay, you got to read this stuff because as a psychologist, uh, have you ever heard of this lab? No. Okay, as a you might want to study this stuff. It's really cool. As a psychologist, he says that the way the, the education group, uh, community does do their studies is wrong. So you have to tell me if it's right or wrong. So you have to come back. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, he conducted studies of studies. You know, whatever meta studies. <laughs> um, he criticized the way many learning style studies were conducted. Uh, he concluded with his co-researchers, and I'll post the paper, that teaching the students preferred learning styles may be counterproductive. <laughs> I hate to say that after all this lecture. <laughs> um, but this is what he believes. Because he believes that basically you're asking people what's easy for them, and then you're doing what's easy for them, not what's hard. And so his feeling was, and this is a lot of educators feel this way, you have to teach what's hard for them. Force them to learn. Make them hate you. I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of what he's saying. It's very interesting. Especially in the case of the ones he's mainly concerned about, these visual verbal things. He basically proved that people who prefer visual learning, it's easier for them. If you force them to learn verbally, they'll remember much better. They may not like you when they're done, but they'll remember better. So it's actually an interesting point of view that it's a little bit different. And also the construct constructivist approach, which is the approach that you teach people in such a way with things that are familiar with to them. If you teach them in ways that are unfamiliar to them, you will do better. Now, I'm not saying he's right or wrong. There are two competing schools of study, but I want you to be aware of it. All right? uh, he developed the concept of desirable difficulties, which is basically what I just said. The idea that Difficult but effective training conditions may be helpful. Um, he talks about something called retrieval-based memory formation. Any idea what that might mean? Retrieval-based memory formation? Memorization. And uh, more importantly, tests. He, he said he goes to places and preaches how wonderful tests are. And he said that in some places he, can, he cannot use the word test because they get angry with him. So he calls them retrieval-based memory formation. <laughs> he says, oh, okay, I only use the word test. They're retrieval-based memory formation. But shows how important tests are. They are the most, according to him and his group, they're the most important tool for learning of everything. Uh, also, value of spacing of learning events to memory and learning. He showed that if you learn something, you're taught something in class, you can answer it very well right after class. But the best way you can learn is to learn something in a class, and then the professor has to apparently teach you a bunch of other stuff for a while, and then go back and return to it about two weeks later and force you to learn it again. The, apparently, the larger the spacing, the better the memory retention in his studies. In fact, for example, if you, if you could try to remember the phone number you had when you were 10 years old, you probably can't do it. However, if someone told you that phone number today and then tested you on it a year from now, you would really remember it. But if you just tried to learn a string of seven numbers today and then somebody tested, tested you on it a year from now, you wouldn't remember it. It's the idea that you have learned things separately many years apart. It's a weird stuff. He's a psychologist. I don't know. I, anyway, value of interleaving various, the idea that don't teach the same thing right after each other. Interleave various topics together. So anyway, um, I'll put his paper on there. You can take a look at his work as well, learn what he has to say. He also studied how to best measure learning, and we'll talk about this next week. Um, especially long-term retention or metacognition. Basically, it's most important for the students to understand that you need to know about their learning process. And he agrees in that case with Felder and everyone else. And this, by the way, refers to one other thing. Last thing I mentioned. I got like another minute or two. Okay. Last thing I mentioned. Has anybody heard about this? Because, uh-oh. <laughs> Quickly, the Hawthorne effect. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of the Hawthorne effect? Psychology, business, Hawthorne effect. Okay.
I'll describe it very quickly. This is a study at the Western Electric Hawthorne Works in Cicero, Illinois. It was a, it was a branch of the Westinghouse Corporation that had 40,000 employees. Huge number of buildings and places there. Uh, here's the symbol, the Hawthorne Western Electric Company. They were one of the first companies, uh, Western Electric, not Westinghouse, Western Electric, to actually use scientific management where they would actually study how their workers were productive and what helped and what didn't. And the Hawthorne effect, I think, has a role to play in students and learning. That's the last thing I'll mention. Uh, what they basically did, they collected data, uh, first of all, on something called the illum an illumination study. They went to the factory, they brought all these researchers in, and they said, we want to see the effect on room lighting, on productivity. So we're going to increase the room lighting by 10%, and we'll measure your productivity. And the productivity went up. Then they said, oh, that's pretty good. We'll increase it another 10%. And it went up a little bit again, like 2%. And they said, this is great. Let's keep raising the light. And so they said, well, we've got to prove it. Lower the lighting. Lower the lighting to the original level. You know what happened to productivity? It went up. No, it went up. <laughs> so then they, then they said, well, uh-oh. <laughs> then, so then they changed it again. They, they, so they started raising and lowering the lighting all over the place. And the productivity stayed good. In fact, went up. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? So they did another study where they took five women and stuck them in a room making electrical relays because that's what they did at that factory. They made relays. So they, they, they basically also in 1927, they, they changed their rest periods, their work hours up and down to, 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 you know, for these women working on these relays that they separated out from the rest of the factory and put in their own special room. And they picked, they selected five women and then later six women to do the study with. And they found out that almost everything they did improved productivity. In fact, all their studies, the productivity just kept going up. They started saying less sleep, more sleep, less sleep, more sleep. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so this kept going on. So they finally said, we got to figure out what's going on. So they called in people from the Harvard Business School. Uh, people Mayo, Mayo and Roethlisberger from the Harvard Business School. And they looked, studied this, and actually didn't publish it until 1966, and created something called the Hawthorne Effect. Well, what do you think was going on? They were getting attention? They were getting attention. The idea that management was walking amongst them, and <laughs> come down from upon high, and was standing there saying, we're trying to do things to improve your conditions, to improve your work. You know, we're trying to do something. All of a sudden, in fact, there's, there's wonderful interviews with these women saying that I've never felt so paid attention to in my life. <laughs> this is, I want to come to work every day. This is great. I got, and they actually, the women who went in this study became tremendous friends and were friends for their entire lives, the women who were in that study. It just happened because they, were, they kept sharing their experiences with this. And, and so they call that the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect is that paying attention makes a difference. So I leave you with that idea because in terms of engineering education and better teaching methods, all right, what does it tell us? Paying attention is good. If, you, if your students know that you're trying to teach better and you're trying to understand their learning and how they learn and what you can do to make it better, you can't do a lot wrong. <laughs> a little secret, <laughs> all right? It all helps because they'll understand that, you're that you care, that what you're doing is important. So discussing students, learning with them is good. That's part of the area called metacognition, helping people understand how they learn. All right? And also what we learned from this, uh, testing, for example, is part of paying attention. It's part of the learning process. If it's done with the learning process in mind, that's where we combine the ideas of Felder and Bjork. All right? And the learning process must reflect and respond to learning objectives, as we already said. And whatever our approach is to learning and teaching, uh, styles, teaching and assessment, both have to be student focused. So hopefully these are ideas that you can come away with today and think about. So what you can do between now and next week, take the learning styles questionnaire, for one thing, and secondly, and I'll have to communicate that with somebody who might show up next week who wasn't here this week, you'll have to teach them, okay. Um, but I'm not going to do this, uh, uh, this was, I was going to do this in groups, but I mean, we're not, but just think about this on your own. How can we use Felder's model, Bjork's concepts, as well as problem-based, active, other types of student-focused teaching and available technologies, which I haven't talked about, to improve teaching in our own classrooms? Try to come up with, with say, three ideas or a couple ideas relevant to yourself. And next week, we'll report back on them. Whatever you can think of to come up with. So think about what I talked about today. See if you can incorporate any of this into things that you do or you might want to do in a classroom, and we'll talk about it. So 
think, think about also your motivation for teaching and improving your teaching. Even think about how you'd explain that to your family or friends, why you think teaching is important. Think about how you would explain that if, if, if somebody in your family asked you, why do you want to be a better teacher? Tell, tell them why. You know, think about that. And then uh, don't forget to go to this website and fill out the question. So I'm sorry I kind of ran through that pretty fast, but any, any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here.